Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. Amen. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth, this earth, as it is in heaven. In praying the prayer the Lord Jesus teaches us in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, we are being granted what many people call the dignity of causality. We are being granted the dignity of making redemptive things happen in our city. On earth, as it is in heaven. In teaching us to pray what is now called the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is inviting us into his radical transformation of life on this planet. On earth, as it is in heaven. Indeed, praying the Lord's Prayer turns out to be the most effective way we mere human beings and sinful human beings at that can participate in the great revolution that began when Jesus of Nazareth was born. You realize that, do you not? That Jesus' birth inaugurated a great revolution? That Jesus came from heaven to earth to work a great revolution on earth as it is in heaven. I know it is a provocative word to use, revolution, especially in this present historical context when all over the world we're witnessing the shaking of the old order of things. But that is what is happening in the life and ministry of Jesus. A changing of the guard, bringing about a massive revolution. It is what Jesus declared in his first public proclamation. He comes on the scene, his arrival having been announced by the prophet John the Baptist, with the stunning news The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe this gospel. Those are the first words out of the mouth of the Savior of the world as he launched his public ministry. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and put your weight on this good news. To paraphrase, history has reached a major turning point, and the glorious, redeeming reign of God has come near. Turn around and put your weight on this great fact. Jesus is declaring that God's radical intervention in the world, which was thought to only take place at the end of time, is now taking place in the middle of time. The long-awaited revolution is underway on earth as it is in heaven, shouted from the mountaintops. And the writers of the Gospels tell us that after announcing the arrival of the kingdom, Jesus straightaway began calling people to follow him. People from all walks of life, from every social strata, fishermen, tax collectors, homemakers, farmers, lawyers, doctors, scholars, prostitutes, calling them to get on board the train. Come, follow in my footsteps. Come, wear my yoke. Come, make your home in me. Come, eat and drink of of the new life of the kingdom. To be called by Jesus Christ to be his disciple in the world is to be called to participate with him in this revolution and therefore called to live his revolutionary kind of life. It is the life Jesus describes in his first major sermon, the now famous Sermon on the Mount, which we have been making our way through for the past months. The sermon which, if more of the world would actually read and take seriously, would result in this being a very different world. 
a very different world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. You have heard it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Which is why it has been wholly appropriate for me to use the word revolution. In his sermon, Jesus is calling us into an upside-down way of living that turns the world right-side up again. Join Jesus, and we find ourselves caught up in a bigger, more life-giving revolution than any of us ever dreamed would happen in the world. And at the heart of this great sermon, Jesus teaches us, his followers, to pray what we now call the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, in heaven. It is right in the middle of his sermon. Jesus teaches his prayer right in the middle of his description of his revolutionary new way of life. Now, why right in the middle? I think as a way of saying, praying this prayer is the most effective way to join me in the divine revolution. And at the heart of his prayer are the words, on earth as it is in heaven. Praying his prayer is participating in an invasion, heaven's invasion of the earth. And praying the Lord's prayer is the most transformative thing you and I can do at this present moment in history. How's that for an introduction? (laughs) When you pray, Jesus says, Pray in this way, in this way, Matthew 6, 9. Now, in the translation that we are reading this morning, it has it, this then is how you should pray. But we should notice there is no should in the original text. Literally, it is thusly. When you pray, pray thusly. Meaning, Jesus is not telling us that we should pray using these exact words in this exact order. On another occasion, Jesus gave his prayer with slightly different words. And I would imagine Jesus taught this prayer using slightly other wording in other settings. Pray thusly. I think it is Jesus' way of saying, here is a way to pray that pleases my Father. Or, here is a way to pray without having to wonder if God is okay with the way we're praying. Now, in this message this morning, I'm simply going to make a number of observations about the prayer as a whole. And then in the next two Sundays, Chris and Alita will unpack it in more depth. But before making these observations, I I want to speak to a question I've been asking for some time. I would imagine it's a question some of you have been asking. Some of you might know that I love to pray the Psalms. I do not know where I would be without praying the Psalms. Every morning since my birthday in 1989, long before some of you were born. I don't know where I'd be without the Psalms. So I've been asking, why does Jesus not say, when you pray... Open the prayer book and begin with the first psalm and pray your way into the heart of God. I, for one, would not be surprised if he said that. For the simple reason that Jesus himself grew up praying the psalms. We know this because his mother Mary, as a faithful, devout Jew, prayed the psalm. This is reflected in the song she sang when she became pregnant with the world's redeemer. She sings her magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord and rejoices in God my savior for he has done great things for me. Going on and using words and images from the Psalms to unfold the revolution she saw her son would work in the world. So Jesus learned to pray, praying the Psalms with his mother. And we know Jesus prayed the Psalms for he prayed them while he was suffering on the cross. It is said that when we come to die, 
we will pray what has been deeply rooted in our souls out of habit. Jesus prays the Psalms as he dies because he's prayed the Psalms all his life. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. I thirst, Psalm 69. Into your hands I commit my spirit, Psalm 31. So why does Jesus not say to us, when you pray, pray the Psalms? Doing so would certainly keep us from meaningless repetition. Why instead give us these six lines we call the Lord's Prayer? Well, I've thought about this for years, and here's my best response at this stage in the journey. In giving us this short six-line prayer, Jesus is in no way saying you need no longer pray the Psalms. Rather, in giving us these six lines prayer, I think Jesus is summarizing the Psalms. Everything the psalmists pray is gathered up in Jesus' six lines. It's brilliant. He's not replacing the psalms. He's gathering up the psalms in a simple, more easily memorable form. Pray in this way, and when we do, we find ourselves praying everything the psalmists pray. Your name be hallowed. It's the greatest passion of the psalmist that the name of Yahweh be honored and vindicated in the world. Your kingdom come. It's the great longing that Yahweh overcome all that is anti-God and rule without rival in the world. Your will be done. But of course, given how good Yahweh is, who would not want to know and live his good will? Give us this day our daily bread. Over and over again, the psalmist celebrate Yahweh's provision for his people. Forgive us our debts. In psalm after psalm after psalm, David and Asaph and the sons of Korah confess their sin and plead for Yahweh's pardon. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. In psalm after psalm, the people of God face enemies too mighty for them to overcome on their own, and they plead for Yahweh's deliverance. The one line of the Lord's Prayer not found in the Psalms is as we forgive our debtors. (laughs) Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, which is why that's the only phrase in the Lord's Prayer Jesus comments on. After the prayer, for if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive your transgressions. But if you do not forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. And for that, we will be need, need to be taken through a huge revolution in our souls. Okay, so let's walk through the Lord's Prayer as a whole. As I said, I'm simply going to make a number of observations about the prayer as a whole. Nothing fancy or sophisticated, just a number of observations, six observations. The teacher of the prayer, the embrace of the prayer, the flow of the prayer, the center of the prayer, the verbs of the prayer, and the person to whom we pray. Okay, here we go. Joining the revolution. Observation one, the teacher of the prayer. This is a critical observation. The teacher of the prayer is Jesus of Nazareth, the Son. The Son. The Son of Mary, the Son of God, the Son of God, the Son of Mary. That is fully human and fully God. The teacher of this prayer is fully human and fully God. As the Son of Mary, he is like Mary, fully human, which means... He knows all about life on this planet. He knows what it means to be a human being in our broken world. And in particular, he knows what it means to pray as a human being. The writer of the book of Hebrews understood this well. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. As the son of Mary, as one of us, Jesus knows what we need to be fully human and fully alive. He says before giving us this prayer, Father knows what you need before you ask. He too knows what he need, we need because he too needed it. As the son of God, 
He is like God, fully God, which means he knows the mind and heart of God. Jesus lives in the Father's heart and mind. He is sent from the Father's heart. Jesus knows what pleases the Father. Jesus knows the Father's passions. Now, all of this suggests that in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is giving us his revelation of his Father. It is as though he was saying, listen, I know the Father, and I know what's on the Father's heart and mind, the hallowing of his name, the coming of his kingdom, the doing of his will, providing for his children's needs, forgiving his children's sins, and freeing them to forgive their sisters and brothers' sin, and delivering his children from the seductive schemes of evil. As the Son of Mary, Son of God, Jesus knows firsthand our true needs and the Father's deepest desires. And in his prayer, he brings them together. The teacher of the prayer is the Son, fully human, fully God. Observation two, the embrace of the prayer. In my book on the Lord's Prayer, I use the term scope of the prayer. I now prefer embrace. It's a more dynamic way of putting putting it, suggesting that in his prayer, Jesus is gathering up all our concerns in his arms and lifting them to the Father. I think you can see that like the Psalms, his prayer embraces everything imaginable. Name any need you have, and it's included in this prayer. Name any issue you face, and it's addressed in this prayer. For example, Jesus embraces all of time. The past. What is our greatest need about the past? Forgive us our debts. The present. What is our greatest need? Give us this day our daily bread. The future. What is our greatest need about the future? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And in his prayer, Jesus embraces all the dimensions of our humanity. Physical, give us this day our daily bread. Relational, social, as we forgive our debtors. Emotional, psychological, deliver us from evil's deception and the twisting of our identity. And Jesus embraces the political. Your kingdom come. Yes, Father, bring your kingdom, your kingdom, your kingdom of true justice and true freedom and authentic community and wholeness. So name any need or concern we have, name any fear or any desire, and we find it embraced by Jesus' prayer. The whole of life is taken up into the embrace of the triune God of grace. Observation three, the flow of the prayer. As already noted, there are six petitions to the prayer. Your name be hallowed, your kingdom come, your will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, there seem to be two halves to this prayer. The first half, name, kingdom, will. The second half, bread, forgiveness, deliverance. Now, did you notice that the two halves employ different pronouns? First half, your, your, your. Second half, us, our, us, we, us, us. The point of the flow? A prioritizing of our needs. Your, your, your. Then us, us, us. Yes, we need bread, right? Yes, we need forgiveness and need to forgive, right? Yes, we need guidance and deliverance, right? Jesus knows this, and he frees us to pray for such things. But we have greater needs than that. We do? Yes, we do. We need name, kingdom, will. We need for the Father's name to be hallowed in us and in the world. We need the Father's kingdom to come in us and in the world. We need the Father's will to be done in us and in the world. Yes, we will experience human flourishing when we have our daily bread, when our sins are forgiven, and when we forgive others, when we are guided into the path of life and protected from the evil one. But Jesus is telling us 
that we will finally experience full human flourishing when our Father's name is treated with reverence and dignity in our hearts and in the world, when our Father's kingdom comes in all its fullness, and when our Father's will is accomplished in our wills and in the will of the world. Thus the flow of the prayer, your before us. Because more critical than the us requests are the your requests. The fact is, that when we focus on the your requests, the us requests are put in their proper perspective. Indeed, it turns out that the us requests are actually absorbed into the your requests. So, the floor, flow of the prayer. Observation four. See, we're moving along at a good pace. <laughs> Observation four. <laughs> what I'm chuckling about is it wasn't 13 minutes in that section. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it was sweet. <laughs> really sweet. <laughs> okay. had, had to look at the boss, make sure I didn't do something dumb right now. <laughs> okay, where was that? Observation four, the center of the prayer. Matthew 6.10, I've already said it seven times, on earth as it is in heaven. It's literally, as in heaven, so also on earth. Now, I think that this goes with all six petitions. It goes with the three before the center, and it goes with the three after the center. Your name be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And... Give us this day our daily bread on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil on earth as it is in heaven. Cool? No? I think this phrase, on earth as it is in heaven, captures the passion of the gospel. It's God's passion to bring the life of heaven to earth. Which is why I said at the beginning of the message, to pray the Lord's Prayer is to participate in an invasion. The invasion of the earth by heaven. I have this picture of us and all the members of all the other churches in our city quietly going around our daily activities, whether we're walking on the street or we're in an office, and quietly praying on earth as it is in heaven. Imagine going to a board meeting, and before you go into the board meeting, on earth as it is in heaven. And can you imagine what would happen? Now, I'm wondering if this center of the prayer might not signal another way to look at the structures of the prayer. I wonder if Jesus has structured the prayer in a parallelism, a stair-step parallelism. I think we have a slide for that. It's also called a chiasm. Do we have that slide up there? Yeah. If this is the case, name and temptation go together, kingdom and forgiveness go together, and will and bread go together. If this is how this is structured then, Jesus is saying that temptation is all about the name of God. That the evil one wants to distort the name of God, the nature and character of God, and get us not to trust the Father. If this is the case, Jesus is saying that the kingdom then is all about relationships. It's all about the restoration of strained and broken relationships through the power of his grace. And Jesus is saying then that the will of God is all about making it possible for human beings to live sustained and productive lives, all on earth as it is in heaven. Observation five, the verbs of the prayer. And here's where things really get exciting. Especially the verbs in the first half. Be hallowed, come, be done. They're bold verbs. They're very bold verbs. In the original, the verbs come first in the sentence for emphasis. So it's not your name be hallowed, but be hallowed your name. It's not your kingdom come, but come your kingdom. It's not your will be done, but done, be done your will. Now, there are two things we need to know about these verbs. The first is that each of them is in the imperative mood. Remember what the imperative mood is all about? What is it? 
command. Especially in the Greek language, which is the language of Matthew 6. The imperative mood is the mood of command. Do this, do that, be this, be that, come, go, stop. Imperative. Now, in the Greek language, the imperative is never used in addressing a superior. It's never used in addressing a superior. Never. One would never enter the premier's office and start using the imperative. Fix this, fix that, build this, build that, reduce that tax and reduce that tax too and help stop the rise of the gasoline prices. (laughs) Never is the imperative used to address a superior. Well, 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 well. Surprise, surprise, surprise. In the Lord's Prayer, we are addressing a superior, are we not? The superior of superiors, right? And Jesus tells us to use the imperative. Be hallowed. Come. Be done. They're all in the imperative. Oh, my. We're not just asking. We're commanding. Yikes. Be, come, be, be hallowed, come, be done, be hallowed your name, come your kingdom, be done your will, do it, do it, do it. Whoa, how does that make you feel? Now remember, who taught us to pray this way? Jesus, son of Mary, son of God. He knows the Father. He knows what pleases the Father. And he is telling us that the Father invites his children to come to him and use the imperative. He's telling us that the Father loves for his children to pray boldly. Do it, Father. And I quickly add, please. (laughs) The second thing we need to know about the verbs is they're in the passive voice. Imperative mood, passive voice. Now, why? Why passive? Partly to bring a note of reverence. It kind of softens this sense of ordering God about. But mostly because only God can do it. Only God can hallow his name. Only God can bring his kingdom. Only God can do God's will. So the prayer is not what we tend to make it. The prayer is not, let us hallow your name. Or let us bring your kingdom. Or let us do your will. We are not the ones doing it. We're not the subject of these verbs. The Father is the subject of the verbs because only the Father can do it. Are you following me? So the prayer is, Father, you do it. We cannot. So you, you do it. You hallow your name on earth as it is in heaven. You bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. You do your will on earth as it is in heaven. We must resist this horizontalizing of the vertical. The Father is the subject of the verbs, not us. Father, right now, your name is being hallowed in heaven. Hallow it on the earth. We can't. You must. Too bold? Father, right now, your kingdom has come in heaven. Make it come on earth. (laughs) Father, right now, your will is being done in heaven. Do it now on earth. How are you now feeling? I feel as though a ton of bricks just got off my soul. Father, you do it, for only you can do it. Bold verbs, very bold verbs. And then observation six, the one to whom we pray. Father, not just any father, the father Jesus knows and loves. The father Jesus knows and trusts. Our father in heaven, in heaven. That means very close at hand, so very close at hand. For many people, heaven is a place way, way up there, far away, but not for Jesus. For Jesus, heaven is another dimension of the created order. It's surrounding the visible order. It's encompassing the tangible order. It's intersecting and infusing and sustaining the dimensions of reality we can see and hear and smell and touch. In heaven, as real and as close as the air we breathe. Heaven turns out to be the atmosphere in which we live and move and have our being. Which is why going to heaven does not involve a long trip. 
Going to heaven simply means slipping to the other side. The one to whom we pray is close. So very, very close. Closer than our breathing. Breathing his breath into us moment by moment. In heaven, it also means on the throne. For Jesus, heaven is God's throne. Earth is his footstool, as he says earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Psalm 123, verse 1. O thou who art enthroned in heaven. Revelation 4, 1. I saw a door open in heaven and a throne with someone sitting on it. The Father, Jesus' Father. Jesus' Father is sitting on the throne of the universe. If this were not so, then prayer would be a potentially futile exercise. But if it is so, then the one to whom we pray can actually do what we're asking him to do. Father, not just almighty, not just rock of ages, not just source of all goodness, but Father, the Father Jesus knows and loves and trusts, the Father Jesus wants us to know and love and trust. I often think I hear Jesus saying to me, you know what your problem is, Daryl? You do not know my Father. If you knew my Father, you wouldn't be as anxious as you are. Let me teach you about my Father, because he wants to be your Father too. The gospel is in that first line of the prayer. Jesus' Father has become our Father. The Apostle John will write in his little letter, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Jesus the Son comes from heaven to earth to bring us into his relationship with his Father so that we can trust and love his Father the way Jesus does, making it possible by sending the Holy Spirit, whom Paul calls the Spirit of Adoption, who enables us to speak to Jesus' Father the way Jesus does, Abba, Father. The teacher of the prayer wants us to know the one to whom we pray to know the intimately good and gracious and generous Father who wants us to know his name, who wants us to be alive in the kingdom, who wants us to thrive in his will, who wants us to have the bread we need to know his name and live his kingdom and thrive in his will, who wants us to know the joy and freedom of forgiveness, who wants us to be delivered from all the lies of the great liar that we might live in the wonder of being children of God. Oh, what a prayer. What a, what a wonder. The Father so loves us that he sends his Son from heaven to earth to make it all happen on earth as it is in heaven, bringing about the most beautiful revolution imaginable. And we get to participate in it simply by praying his prayer.